Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. and welcome to the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. I'm Heidi Shoup, President of the Council, and it's my privilege to welcome you all here this evening. All politics is local, a common phrase in the United States, a phrase coined by former Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill, and often that has appeared to be the case. But more and more with 24-7 news cycles and with globalization and the interconnectedness of our global economies, Americans are becoming aware of the implications and effects here at home of foreign policy options and actions. This foreign policy panel discussion will feature three senior political analysts who will share with us their thoughts on President Obama's foreign policy in his three years in office. In addition to our distinguished panelists, we are most fortunate to have as our moderator Brian Kelly, editor of US News and World Report, and a member of the board of directors of the World Affairs Council. <coughs> Mr. Kelly has been an editor of U.S. News and World Report since April of 2007. During the course of a 30-year career in journalism, he has covered Capitol Hill, the presidency, and politics. He is one of the nation's most experienced magazine editors in steering national and international news content. Within, the, within U.S. News, he is constantly expanding the magazine's best franchises, such as the immensely popular annual <laughs> education reports, America's best colleges, and America's best graduate schools. Prior to joining U.S. News, Brian worked at the Washington Post as deputy editor of the, Su uh, the Sunday Outlook section, and later as congressional editor. He also worked as editor of Regardi's magazine covering politics and business in the Washington area. His publications include Adventures in Porkland, How Washington Wastes Your Money and Why They Won't Stop, and he co-authored with Mark London, The Last Forest, the <coughs> Amazon and the Age of Globalization. He's a frequent guest on all the national television uh, programs, including uh, ABC, CNN, Fox, The Today Show, The Tonight Show, and more. Tonight, he gets to ask the questions. So without further delay, please welcome the distinguished members of our panel and Mr. Kelly. Heidi, thank you. That was such a long intro, I'm going to have to cut these guys a little short here. But uh, um, I, I just want to say um, that, that I'm delighted to be here, and, and you guys are lucky to be here, because uh, we, we've got a really terrific um, uh, group of folks here. Uh, you could run the foreign policy establishment of a medium-sized country with the talent on this panel, and that does not include me. Um, th this, the book, if you have seen it, if you haven't get, gotten it, please get it. It is a terrific a uh, clear, comprehensive, very even-handed assessment of obviously one of the most important issues facing us, uh, the, the foreign policy uh, of the United States and, and the uh, role of President Obama in an election year. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is detailed. It is told in a wonderfully, wonderful narrative fashion. I don't know how these three guys pulled it off and without arguing with each other, but we it's... Uh, <laughs> we'll get into the de We'll get into that. But, but it's, it's really seamlessly told, and, and I say, I think I stress the notion of, of even-handed and fair and, and knowing. Um, you really have the sense when you read this book that, um, that, that these guys know where they're coming from. Obviously, they do. They've been there. Um, but they have also taken a very uh, clear-eyed approach to, to an, a number of important, complicated questions, and, and we're going to have an opportunity to, to, to pry into those as, as we go forward here. Um, so uh, the, the, what we're going to do format-wise is I'm going to ask each of them to give a little introduction of their uh, take on the book itself and some of their parts of it. They all have a, a variety of expertise, some of it overlapping. Um, and then I'm going to probe them with some questions for a while, and then we're going to let you have at them um, <laughs> with some of your thoughts on this. So um, you know, briefly, um, <coughs> Ambassador Martin Indyk, uh, former Ambassador to Israel, uh, uh, member of uh, in a number of uh, capacities in the, in the uh, Clinton uh, foreign policy establishment. Uh, Ken Lieberthal directs the uh, center, uh, the John Thornton Center of China for the Brookings Institution, uh, formerly again of the National Security Council in the Clinton administration. 
uh, Michael O'Hanlon, senior fellow at Brookings Institution uh, and the director of research for foreign policy. Um, let me start. Um, we're, the the uh, task here is alphabetical as they're arrayed, so we're not picking any favorites. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Martin and we'll work, work down and then go from there. So, Martin, thank you. Brian, thank you very much, and thanks very much to the World Affairs Council for hosting us uh, this evening. I, too, work at Brookings. So. Yes, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is a Brookings uh, uh, effort by um, the three of us who are colleagues there. Uh, and uh, we essentially uh, wrote this book together, made the arguments, uh, worked out the arguments uh, and thesis in it together. Uh, but we uh, did take uh, primary responsibility for the parts of the book that are in our particular areas of expertise. So no big surprise, I dealt with the Middle East issues, Ken dealt with China and uh, East Asia uh, issues and North Korea and uh, Mike um, did the wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, the soft power and uh, a range of other things that he'll, he'll talk about. But essentially, um, we uh, all agreed on the basic uh, a thesis that is presented there. The, the title of the book is Bending History, and that is an adaptation of uh, President Obama's uh, favorite quote. It's so much his favorite quote that he has it embroidered in his uh, rug in the Oval Office. Um, and it uh, is a quote from Martin Luther King, Jr., uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, and some of you here will remember it. Uh, it's lovely to see so many young faces. I'm not sure you will, but uh, it, it was a speech in which he used his usual rhetorical device and he said, how long will it take before we have freedom and, and equal rights? Uh, how long? And he went into his various versions of why it wouldn't take long. And he ended up by saying, how long? Not long because the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And uh, on various occasions during his presidency, Barack Obama has used that quote at moments that he regards as of historical importance in his presidency. And so that's why we call it bending history, because essentially that's what we so see Barack Obama trying to do with his presidency in the area of foreign policy, bend history towards a better world, a more just, more free, uh, more stable, more prosperous world. Um, and he came into office with a soaring vision of how he would do that, that captivated many people, especially young people. Uh, and the vision didn't just apply to uh, domestic policy, although it certainly there was a lot of that, but it applied to the better world that he wanted to make as well. And, and the uh, point that we try to make in this book is that uh, while the vision was clear and, and inspiring, uh, and the president himself was a historic figure from day one, being the first African-American president to be elected, United States, uh, <coughs> that it fell short. Um, and part of the reason it fell short was the kind of obvious one is the world doesn't always uh, bend its will to uh, uh, in intentions to what the American president wants. And he had a particularly hard job of it given the circumstances he's faced, particularly the, the uh, Great Recession at home and, and it's uh, uh, the way it, in which it spread abroad, uh, and a whole range of very difficult circumstances abroad, including the way in which the United States' own a position in the world had been seriously undermined and tarnished um, by uh, the, uh, at least the first administration of George W. Bush and the war in Iraq and Guantanamo Bay and all of those things. Um, so he had a very steep hill to climb. Uh, but the way he climbed it uh, was, I think, particularly important uh, to uh, the fact that he fell short on achieving this soaring vision because uh, the president speaks beautifully about his vision 
but he acts in ways designed to achieve compromises. And when he compromises, he inevitably cannot achieve his vision. And there is a gap that opens up between the vision and the results. And uh, the results are the product of what I call progressive pragmatism. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike O'Hanlon calls it something different, but I'll leave him to, to describe it. But essentially, we're talking about the same thing. He is progressive in the sense of he wants to change the world, but he is pragmatic in the way he goes about it. And that combination produces a disappointment amongst many of those who were inspired by his vision, but are less than overwhelmed by, his, uh, by the results. Nevertheless, we conclude that judged <coughs> by the standard of protecting the American national <coughs> interest, he's done a pretty good job. Uh, but judged by the standard of his own objectives established by his soaring vision, he has fallen short. And bending history remains uh, very much a work in progress. Let me just say a, a couple of words about, a couple of words, a couple of sentences about, about the Middle East area. Uh, in terms of achieving uh, peace between the Israelis and Palestinians, that is probably the most glaring example of the gap that I've been talking about. Um, because from day one, he made it a high priority to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And unfortunately, and notwithstanding his good intentions, he failed. And he failed in a way that really increased the disappointment of uh, both the Israelis and the Palestinians uh, in him and the Arab world and the Muslim world more broadly. And, and um, we can go into the question of why that happened. Essentially, the essence of it is that I believe he had the wrong theory of the case. That he had the right intentions, but he went about it the wrong way and, and um, ended up with a result the opposite of what he intended. Uh, on the Arab awakenings, he wasn't a big promoter of democracy uh, anywhere in the world. That was what George W. Bush did, and he was anything but Bush. Uh, but nevertheless, kind of democracy happened, or at least the beginnings of democratic transitions occurred on his watch. And he was suddenly confronted with this situation in which he made the fundamentally right decision. And it wasn't an easy decision uh, to get on the right side of history, to recognize that these former alli staunch allies of the United States, like Hosni Mubarak of Egypt, were indeed history. And he needed to position the United States on the side of change. Uh, and, and as I say, that was the right judgment. But in terms of when we go into the details of how he handled each of the, the revolutions from, from uh, uh, Egypt to Libya to uh, Bahrain and then Syria, uh, he adopted a different approach as reflecting, on the one hand, his desire to be on the right side of history to promote change there, and on the other hand, his desire to protect American interests there. And it was a kind of messy conclusion in which, on the one hand, he helped to push Mubarak out the door and got rid of Gaddafi in Libya, but on the other hand, stood by the king of Bahrain and the king of Saudi Arabia in ways that really question uh, uh, how serious we were about the whole enterprise. Uh, again, we can go into more details. Finally, on Iran, uh, I think that he has done a, a very credible job. His uh, Republican opponents accuse him of failing to stop you. Iran's uh, nuclear program, but he's done much more than any previous president to put the screws to Iran, to concert the international community, particularly bringing the Russians and the Chinese along for harsh, even crippling sanctions designed to get the Iranians to make a strategic decision in favor of giving up their nuclear weapons ambitions. That is still in play today, and we don't know the outcome. But I think that Obama has done a very credible job in terms of uh, doing his best short of starting another war in the Middle East to uh, uh, put Iran in a position where hopefully it will decide to accept curbs on its nuclear weapons program. Thank you.
Uh, Martin provide a ver provided a very good overview of the book as a whole. Uh, I think Mike and I will give far shorter comments and just highlight a couple of issues. Uh, I was asked to... Um, I was asked to, is this okay? Good. Uh, I was asked, could you hear Martin or was this all lost? <laughs> um, I was asked to give a few takeaways from writing this book and uh, let me suggest three. Uh, and They're kind of elaborations on themes that Martin uh, raised. One is simply foreign policy is really hard. You know, in foreign policy, you're dealing with other national leaders, and every national leader of every serious country got to be a national leader through domestic politics. And every one of them puts domestic politics first. So none of them will ever agree to do, and then will follow through and implement anything that will weaken their domestic political position. That makes it difficult to apply broad visions to the reality of the international arena. In addition, uh, a president's success or lack of success domestically deeply impacts his capacity to pursue his goals in foreign policy. So for example, when we had the imbroglio over uh, increasing our national debt limit last summer, uh, this did enormous damage to American credibility in Asia. I don't think you can see the President's November trip to Asia last year where he affirmed what was called the U.S. pivot to Asia or rebalancing toward Asia. Uh, you can't fully appreciate what was going on without understanding that in part this was to try to regain some credibility that America could walk and chew gum at the same time. That we will be out there for a long time in a big way. Because frankly, as of that summer, it looked like the President could get nothing done at all, and the U.S. was going to consume itself in his own bitter domestic disputes. So domestic success or lack of success really does impact on what you can do uh, in the international arena. Second takeaway is that well-executed strategies fall short if they aren't based on a deep understanding of the other country you're trying to influence. Uh, Martin suggested that the President had the wrong theory of the case in the Israeli-Palestinian issue. With China, it was a very interesting thing. The President came into office wanting to treat China as a major power globally, feeling that the Chinese would appreciate recognition of this kind of ink, of their coming to top table on major global issues, uh, would enjoy the respect that this suggested and would be willing, more willing to engage with the United States because we now were giving them their place in the sun. What he never anticipated was that in China, there was a, uh, a storyline that said effectively that America is number one, but America is in deep trouble and is declining. Remember, this is the height of the financial crisis. China is number two. It was just that year passing Japan to become the world's second largest GDP. And the momentum is in China's favor. And inevitably, number one will do whatever it can to prevent number two from closing the gap with number one. Therefore, Obama's trying to engage China as a leading player on global economic recovery, on climate change. Remember, the Copenhagen Conference was coming up at the end of 2009 and on issues of nuclear proliferation, not only North Korea, but Iran and more globally, was interpreted in China as part of a U.S. strategy to have China prematurely begin to take on global obligations while it was still a developing country, and thereby waste its resources and get entangled in obligations that would slow down its development. And therefore, this showed that the conspiracy theory about U.S. intentions was probably well-grounded. Frankly, the President had never thought that anyone would interpret his initiatives in that context. It just had never occurred to him. As he came to realize it, he adjusted how he dealt with the Chinese. He's a very pragmatic and capable guy, but you really do have to understand the mindset of the, of the people you're dealing with in order to be effective with them, and that takes a process. And then finally, and this again plays off of comments that Martin made about Iran, 
uh, to evaluate results, you have to look at the ancillary effects, not only at the main goal. So, for example, with North Korea, uh, the President has had a serious strategy to try to get the North Koreans to unwind their nuclear program. That strategy has failed completely to get the North Koreans to unwind their nuclear program. But it has been the basis and a significant contributor to sig significantly enhancing our overall posture in Northeast Asia, uh, building stronger ties with a new Japanese political party in power that came into power not very excited about the United States and wanting to move closer to China, and also solidifying our ties with South Korea, bringing that alliance to a level that, frankly, I don't think it had ever achieved before. Uh, so if you want to really evaluate the strategy for dealing with North Korea, you have to go beyond North Korea. The, you know, arguably, no one could have gotten North Korea to give up his nuclear program, but at least he pursued it in a way, as he did with Iran, that had a lot of ancillary diplomatic benefits for the United States and our interests. So three quick takeaways. Foreign policy is hard. Well-executed strategies fall short if they aren't based on a subtle understanding of the, those you're trying to influence. And when you evaluate results, don't only look at the headline, look at the ancillary developments, because sometimes that's where the story really lies. Thank you. Mike. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, everybody here. And Brian, it's a pleasure for me as well. Let me just talk very briefly in this opening comment about Iraq. And I, I suspect that Afghanistan, not to mention other potential conflicts, may come up in the discussion. But I really just want to talk about the evolution of Barack Obama as a pragmatist, or the term that I like, uh, is a reluctant realist on the issue of Iraq. Because as we all remember, this was one of the most divisive issues in the country not so long ago. It was certainly one of the issues that Barack Obama used not only to ultimately win the presidency, but to defeat Hillary Clinton, who of course had been seen as more supportive of the war, having voted uh, to authorize it previously. Uh, and it was an issue where Obama really resonated, his message resonated with the Democratic base and elements of the base that provided the real oomph and energy for his candidacy that helped not only allow him to defeat such a well-established and respected figure as Hillary Clinton, but to generate an excitement and a level of enthusiasm around the country and the world that was really notable and that has created, to some extent, the expectations gap that Martin talked about, where he's now measured not only against what predecessors might have done or what problems exist, but against the expectations and hopes that people had, which is a pretty high bar uh, given the way 2007, 2008 went. Now, of course, he had a lot of positive messages back in 07, 08, but he also had the very negative message that Iraq was the wrong war and that we had to get the, had to get the heck out, get this behind us, uh, recognize the mistake, it was interesting at the time, I, I was always struck by just how tough he could be in his rhetoric, how critical of other people, of the administration, of others. And I admired his ability rhetorically to be a candidate of hope and change and vision and yet know how to land a pretty heavy blow at the same time at the expense of George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, or even Hillary when necessary. He was angry about this war and he wanted to tap into the anger that the country felt. And I'm really just trying to depict the history as I think it was unfolding. Um, at that time, I was more hopeful about the surge, uh, but leave that aside, the point is that Obama had a very clear message about Iraq in 2007 and into 2008. But then he got both lucky and good. He got lucky because Iraq started improving quickly, almost on a cue to where he needed the issue to evolve each and every moment of his candidacy. So through the Democratic primaries, it was still widely seen as a mess, even though the surge was beginning to show some promise, but it was very incipient and hard to identify. And so he could still use the anger about the Iraq War to uh, motivate his followers to defeat Hillary Clinton. And then he was going to have to take on this formidable task of taking on John McCain in the general election. McCain, who had never made the mistakes of the Bush administration on Iraq, he wasn't necessarily guilty for the tactical missteps. Uh, you know, you could blame him for being in favor of the war in the first place, but he was seen as a very credible uh, foreign policy strategist and one of the most accomplished that our country has probably ever produced as a presidential candidate, certainly among those who have been defeated. Um, and yet, just as, as that campaign was shaping up, the Iraqi prime minister himself was saying that American forces were no longer needed in the numbers that previously were anticipated. The surge had really begun to work, and we should start negotiating a plan to get Americans out. 
And as you'll recall, that plan was negotiated by the end of 2008, but it was well underway before the election. And George W. Bush and Prime Minister Maliki signed a deal that Barack Obama ultimately followed through on, which had American forces leave Iraq by the end of 2011. But candidate Obama was saying, I want to be out by sometime fairly early in 2010. And in fact, there was time where his language suggested it might even be as soon as the winter of 2010, certainly by the late spring. He used a formulation of, I'll be out within 16 months with all of our main combat forces. Sometimes he said, I'll get one or two brigades out per month. And that would have implied an even faster departure. Well, he wound up taking 19 months to take us down to 50,000 troops which were reconstituted in a little bit of a semantic sleight of hand as advise and assist brigades. But the reason that they were appreciated was not just for their academic or professorial skills. Uh, they still had a lot of tanks and a lot of helicopters, and they were appreciated for their combat power. But Obama managed to say, I'm, I'm honoring the spirit of my campaign pledge, but at the same time, he was taking his time to get out. And he ultimately did not get out with that last 50,000 forces until the very timeline that George W. Bush had negotiated with Prime Minister Maliki. So that's why I say he was lucky and good. He was lucky in the sense that the circumstances evolved in a way that made his previous policies no longer seem uh, quite as preposterous or quite as forward-leaning. But he also slowed down his own earlier policies and brought them into sync with Iraq as it was evolving on the ground. And then finally, just to prove that he wasn't just a latter-day John McCain or George W. Bush, he then did something that a lot of people thought he wouldn't do, and frankly that I was hoping we wouldn't have to do, but the Iraqis sort of made it inevitable, which is he did leave. He took all of our forces out by the end of 2011 at a time when a number uh, of Americans, including myself, had hoped that we would reach an agreement to keep some additional level of, of American forces for another couple of years at a much smaller level. Now, I was hopeful that would happen, but once the Iraqis said no, once the Iraqis refused immunity, I think Obama did the right thing by leaving, and we say that in the book. We say that he sent the message that Americans won't stay beyond their welcome. And so he was constantly balancing his messages. He sounded like a dove, an angry anti-war dove on the campaign trail. He wound up being a pragmatist as president. He let his commanders determine a lot of the pacing of how he got out. He followed George W. Bush's schedule, but ultimately he also did leave. And this paints a portrait of a complex thinking person. And frankly, as somebody who had a little bit of a falling out with his campaign in 07 over this very issue, I admire very much how he's handled this portfolio since becoming president. I think he's been pragmatic, thoughtful. He's found a way, as politicians must, I suppose, to sound like it was all what he intended in the first place anyhow. But it wasn't. It was a very, uh, very uh, major modification to his original plan but it was in spirit, in, in keeping with the general essence of what he wanted to do. And most of all, it supported American national security interests in that particular conflict, which whether you like it or not, whether you were in favor of it or not, presidents don't get to choose what they inherit from their predecessor. Obama had to deal with the world as it was, and on Iraq, he did a good job. Um, one, of the, one other takeaway that I had um, that sort of underlies the book, runs through it, is the notion that the, the, the other big constraint on, on Obama and on American foreign policy is the American economy. And let me ask Ken, if you start with that, t t tell us a little bit about how, how you see that fitting into this whole puzzle. In Asia, uh, which is my area of uh, primary concern, uh, the big question, there are two big questions. One is, what is China's future? Every Asian country, let me put this in context. In the year 2000, every Asian country other than Laos and Cambodia, Nepal and Burma, uh, conducted most of its foreign trade with the United States. In the year 2009, and from then till now, every Asian country, including those I just named, conducts most of its foreign trade with China. Every Asian country has built its future prosperity in part based on expectations of participating in China's ongoing development. No Asian country that I'm aware of wants to see China leverage that economic uh, uh, position for security and diplomatic advantage. 
everyone wants the U.S. to be there in a major way, in part for economic opportunity, but in part so there's uh, a big player in the room other than China. But there is deep concern about whether the U.S. has the staying power to do that. And the concern is primarily economic because ultimately uh, security is expensive. And so if you're going to have a major security presence 7,000 miles from here on a sustained basis, you need to be able to afford it. And we see that playing out now uh, as we're facing a potential what's called sequestration of nearly half a trillion U.S. dollars uh, from the defense budget over the coming decade. Uh, that will cut very deep. So a big issue is will America get its domestic housing order? Will we, within the next two to three years now, reach the kind of national accord to bend the curve on our uh, budgetary expenditures and our, and our governmental income so that we do not get so mired in debt that it affects our capacity to be a major presence in the region. Everyone in Asia looks at that issue. And when there's evidence that we're getting our act together, people feel good. And when there's evidence such as, this is why this debt ceiling crisis was such a catastrophe for us, because it was totally unnecessary, and we walked up to the, to the edge of defaulting on our debt. I mean, almost inconceivable in terms of self-inflicted you know, self, uh, self wound, and the president seemed unable to cope with it, right? A recalcitrant Congress, and the president was just hogtied, did enormous damage. So the shadow of the future looms large, what everyone is looking at in Asia is, will we get on top of our fiscal problems? Uh, and if we do, our credibility out there is high. And then it's a matter of managing the specifics so that we uh, both have a strong leadership role, give others confidence, and also have the kind of relationship with China that doesn't divide Asia, but rather makes the region stable and uh, enables us to benefit from that. Let me. One of the uh, fascinating insights throughout the book is is when you talk about the the, the character of the president and his decision making and the staffing, which f fluctuates and ultimately perhaps becomes less uh, assertive. And, and there's a, a sense of he becomes the lone ranger almost by the end of this, making so many of these decisions on his own. Martin, talk 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 to me ab about uh, that a little bit. How how do you see uh, the 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 character of the president a in this decision making foreign policy process? Well, first of all, uh, President Obama is, is uh, very smart. Um, and he also uh, has studied history and came into office with a clear sense of where he wanted to take the United States in foreign policy. Uh, he's a man who has a lot of confidence in himself. Uh, he's a I don't think I'm telling the audience anything they don't know, but it all combines in the way that he handled foreign policy. He has a lot of confidence in himself, in his own judgment, um, and he tends to be um, aloof and some would say cold, others would say cool. Uh, and all of that combined, um, I think, lead, leads us to conclude that he is his own foreign policy advisor that uh, above all, uh, he listens to himself and he makes his own judgment. He listens well to a lot of other people, but, uh, and he's keen to interrogate his advisors. But ultimately, he keeps his own counsel and he makes his own decisions. Um, he uh, 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 was, uh, I think, part of his self-confidence was demonstrated in the national security team that he put together. The fact that he would take on his primary rival, Hillary Clinton, as his Secretary of State, was a very bold move, but a, a reflection of, of a good deal of self-confidence. Uh, the fact that she would agree to be his loyal lieutenant was also, I think, uh, uh, an indication of her own 
character and commitment to, to the United States. Uh, having done that, he then had to take on a national security advisor who had equal gravitas, especially because he kept on, and again, this was a bold decision on his part, he kept on uh, George W. Bush's Secretary of Defense, uh, Bob Gates, and and therefore, he had in his Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State two strong, experienced uh, uh, politicians and, and policymakers. Uh, and he needed somebody to, to kind of referee that. And so he, he picked Jim Jones as his national security advisor. It was an interesting choice. On the one hand, Jones had gravitas and experience, but uh, nobody would would mistake him for being a, a strategist in the Brzezinski or Kissinger mold. Um, and I don't think that Obama wanted that or needed that. Um, and it's the same thing with his subsequent appointments in the National Security Council. Mm. Uh, so uh, that's, w that's what I think you see uh, is, is the, that combination of self-confidence, uh, picked a strong national security team, but uh, essentially concentrated foreign policy decision making in the White House where he was very much the decider. Yeah. Michael, let me ask you an interesting maybe irony we might call it is it, it, from a political perspective, the president uh, and, and the campaign advisors are pushing very hard on some of his foreign policy accomplishments, particularly military related accomplishments. Uh, just in today we saw John McCain stepping out and saying there's too much leaking for political purpose. Uh, even some of the some of the Democrats are critical of this. What do you think is going on there? Are they overplaying their hand on 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 trying to highlight it, the 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 military policy successes, or is this a legitimate uh, issue for him to be to be putting forward in a strong way like this? Brian, that's a very tough question about um, a good question about these recent developments about David Sanger's book, uh, who we like to see as our competitor. Uh, he, put, he may not view us that way himself. But in any event, um, I think that that book had more than I expected and probably a little more than it should have. I'll say that. I don't know if my co-authors agree. This is not a group position because his book <laughs> came out after ours. Uh, but I also think that, and this is, I think, backing up something that Martin just said, that Obama, sure, he's a politician. Sure, he's saying some of the things he needs to say to put his foreign policy in a favorable light. But he's also pretty self-confident and, I think, not too insecure about his foreign policy. He's in campaign mode, and they're going to look for ways to talk about their better uh, achievements. And also, of course, Iran, where I agree very much with Martin uh, that it's been, on balance, uh, policy pretty well handled. Nonetheless, is obviously, at best, a work in progress and could easily tip against the president in the next five months before Election Day. And so it's a good moment to remind the world, uh, including our Israeli friends, but especially American voters, that this president's been doing a lot. And I think there is a certain amount of trying to inoculate uh, the administration against what may happen in the next five months. Um, so I don't think it was a national security uh, travesty that David Sanger's book contained a few details that arguably would have been better left out by those administration officials that he interviewed. Uh, I do tend to think it went a little far in terms of what they told him. Uh, but on balance, uh, I think that Obama has a reasonably solid foreign policy, uh, but he is concerned about how the Iran issue will play. And that's part of what we saw in these recent discussions. Yeah. All right, I'm going to ask a difficult question uh, and it, for, for each of you. I can't let you get away without d dealing with this. And Ken, you said foreign policy is hard. So we're going to, uh, there's an election coming up which probably everyone's aware of. What happens uh, if there's an Obama II, uh, quick strokes on foreign policy? How, how do you see him? Do you, does he change? Does so, are there things he can accomplish? And um, if it's not Obama II, uh, give us just your, your early take on, on Romney I. So let me, Michael, why don't we start with you? Maybe I'll take one piece of that and then leave my co-authors to both correct me on that piece and then go on to the other, to the other one. Um, I, th I think that, first of all, I can begin with what the book says Obama II should be about, and that is economic recovery. And it builds on the point that Ken was discussing earlier. Because the book, as you can see, is nuanced, and it talks about a lot of different issues in parts of the world. 
And then you might have thought that ultimately we would conclude by saying, well, either his nuclear free world vision or his repairing the breach with the Muslim world vision or his alternative energy vision or his uh, reducing global poverty vision should become the centerpiece. And we would make our argument for why one of those four or five was the most important thing to do in a second term. But we actually don't. What we say is that because of the realities of the world, as Martin was discussing a few minutes ago, American economic recovery has become the preeminent foreign policy objective, not just the preeminent domestic and economic objective. Because for the reasons Ken was saying, this has become a metric of our global power. And I love the phrase that Ken often employs, the shadow of the future is large. Around the world, people recognize that America may or may not decline in a radical way. And the debate is alive and well. We've all seen some of the books that have come out, including one by our own colleague, Bob Kagan. I think it's fair to say that as much as we all admire Bob's writing and book, we're all a little more worried about the possibility of American decline than he is, uh, for those of you who know what his basic argument has been. And frankly, I think it's, speaking for myself, open uh, as a debating point whether or not we will recover in a way that allows us to retain our role of the global leader. Now, global leader doesn't have to mean the same thing it used to. Uh, clearly, we need to share responsibilities and burdens with others more, uh, and all of that's necessary. But if the bottom falls out on our economic strength, the bottom also falls out on our national power and the very world system that has been constructed and has worked so well for so many for so long. So this has to be Obama's top charge, or Romney's, for that matter, in a second term. Um, not surprisingly, I would agree with that. <laughs> Uh, let me make the point even more sharply, which is that I think that when you look at America's role going forward and decide which person to vote for for president in this election, uh, the question that should really concentrate your mind is who is more likely to be able to deliver a national package to deal with our fiscal problems going forward. And, uh, you know, that's a, we may have some disagreement here among that. But the next president, I believe very strongly, in the first half of his term, has to be able to drive a deal with the Congress to put together you know, tax revenues and budgetary discipline uh, that point the way to a sustainable future. And if not, I think that's going to significantly affect the out years in foreign policy capability. It, you're just going to see some erosion setting. I think that erosion will become more severe over time. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to sound overly determinist on that, but as these things play out, that is a very corrosive factor if we can't get together on. One more comment I guess I'd make since you asked about both uh, Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. Let me make just one comment about Mitt Romney, which is to say what he said to date on foreign policy I think is ancillary to the campaign and I hope is not serious. Uh, it is very much in campaign mode as far as I can see, but it has things like we should both use military force against Iran, and I will assure you our oil prices will go down. <laughs> you know, uh, on China, uh, I will declare them a currency manipulator on day one of my presidency. For, I think he's going to be in a parade that day, but, but that aside. Uh, no, but seriously, you know, it, that's the kind of thing you really don't want to say is very specific. And therefore, every uh, a, a segment of our political spectrum on day two will say, now, why didn't you do that on day one? But it frankly would be so stupid to do on day one that I can't imagine he would do it. Uh, and just a technicality, he doesn't have the power to do it. Only the Secretary of Treasury does. But that's a technicality. Uh, so, but, you know, fundamentally at this point, I think candidate Romney has not sketched out any kind of detail on foreign policy that, frankly, anyone should hope the U.S. seeks to follow. Uh, so, but there's a long history of campaigning, especially in primaries, and then shifting quite a bit uh, as elections loom. He gets one mulligan on that, yeah, right? Uh, basically, yes. Okay. Martin. Uh, I think it's hard to answer your question, Brian, because uh, the candidates... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to answer. Uh, because the can for a different reason. The candidates have not yet entered the fray directly uh, and foreign policy is not, this campaign is not going to be about foreign policy. Uh, it's about the economy. And uh, who can be a better custodian of, of the economy? And as a consequence, uh, today it's very hard to say 
what Obama is going to do in foreign policy, let alone what Romney is going to do in foreign policy. They simply haven't laid it out. And that, that's for good reason, because there's a, di a different issue that, that uh, they need to be uh, focusing their campaigns on. I actually think the differences between them on foreign policy are, are very limited. And, and um, that actually, if you, I mean, in, in, I'm painting it in gross terms, but if you look at, at the differences between Republicans and Democrats over the last four years in a deeply divided, polarized situation on domestic issues where they seem not to be able to agree on anything, on most foreign policy issues, they basically agree. And I'm not just talking about Obama and Romney, I'm talking about Democrats and Republicans in, in, in the House and, and the Senate. Uh, and so I, uh, I believe that Romney is, is much more of a um, Bush uh, 41 uh, Republican when it comes to foreign policy, much closer to Scowcroft than Bolton. Uh, in that regard, but we'll have to see. That's just my sense of who he is and who's around him and who's advising him. Mm. Uh, although, I mean, there yes, there are the neocons I in there, but but I, I just uh, that's my instinct. And Obama, we don't really know, but from our own study of him, bending history towards justice will remain his lodestar. Mm -hmm. We're going to ask you to stand up if you have questions and, and come forward. Thank you, I'm Tom Reckford uh, with the World Affairs Council and the Malaysia America Society. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Lieberthal. You, you talk quite eloquently about improved relations with Japan and uh, South Korea. I wonder if you'd talk a bit about improved relations with all of Southeast Asia uh, and including uh, the President's uh, rather successful visit to the East Asia Summit and uh, a carefully nuanced policy on Burma that has led to a very hopeful change there. Uh, the president uh, came into office feeling that the Bush administration had taken his eye off of Asia, which he argued, I think correctly, is the most important region of the world for the United States, and had focused too much on the Middle East. And so what you see when President Bush traveled to Asia during his presidency, all he talked about was Asia as part of the global war on terror. And Asians have concerns about terror, but that is not their only major concern. Uh, president Obama saw himself as America's first Pacific president, spent part of his childhood in Indonesia, uh, and was determined to build the capacity to shift resources on balance from the Middle East toward Asia. Uh, and to engage fully in Asia in Asian regional issues, in issues of concern to Asia and to the, the Asian Pacific region itself. I think what we saw in late 2011 with, with the trip you referred to to Asia was the culmination of three years of trying to put in place the building blocks for that. Uh, he, on that trip, chaired the East Asia Summit, first year the U.S. had participated in that forum. Uh, he talked a great deal about and increased the focus on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a new uh, trade and investment platform for the region that is still in a process <coughs> of development, but he really upped the ante uh, on that. Uh, and he demonstrated, I think, everywhere he went, a tremendous rapport with leaders throughout the region, especially in Southeast Asia, an area that President Bush had not done very well in. Uh, so I think he has really rebalanced our policy, not only from the Middle East toward Asia, you know, these are not either or, but a matter of, of uh, an evolution of priorities, uh, but he also has devoted a great deal of attention to Southeast Asia. And to my mind, as someone who, who was, was responsible for Asia under President Clinton for several years, uh, I think President Obama has done a better job than any previous president that I've seen in integrating policy toward Asia as a whole, uh, South, Southeast, East, and Northeast Asia, from the Indian subcontinent through taking advantage of, I mean that in the best sense, uh, being responsive to 
uh, gradually evolving opportunities in Burma uh, through building bridges throughout Southeast Asia and getting much more deeply engaged there, through paying a great deal of attention to China, to really solidifying our relationship with South Korea and building relations uh, with the, with the uh, government in Japan now after a rocky patch when, when the LDP lost power there. So I would give them very high marks for overall developing over a three-year period finally an integrated Asian strategy that very much builds Southeast Asia into the mix and balances economic, diplomatic, and military uh, uh, components. With the Middle East right now, the thing that comes most to mind is the ongoing violence in Syria. And I was wondering if you thought the Obama administration was being um, very impotent or not as capable as it should be on Syria in encouraging some sort of international action, and if that's the result of this being an election year, if he's afraid of avoiding, or if he's afraid of creating like a very controversial decision in terms of foreign policy. There is a, uh a desire on the president's uh, part in terms of uh, his, his re-election campaign to be a president that ended the wars in the greater Middle East, not the president that started a new one. And uh, that is part of the calculation when it comes uh, to Syria. Uh, the second uh, point is, picking up on what Ken said at the beginning, uh, foreign policy is hard, and there are a lot of places where you're faced with no good options. And Syria is one of those places. Obviously, the, the Assad regime is a, a horrendously brutal regime um, that has lost uh, legitimacy in the eyes of its people and, and needs to be replaced s much sooner than later, yesterday, right? But on the other hand, who do you support? The opposition is not coherent. Uh, it's not possible to simply go in there and get behind a, uh, a political leadership or a m military leadership on the ground that has a coherence that can be supported. There's no there there. Um, and there is the old uh, point about the Hippocratic Oath, which is, you know, do no harm. Uh, by getting involved in some of the ways in which some of our colleagues are arguing for at Brookings, uh, providing arms to the opposition, um, that could end up fueling a sectarian war, uh, the likes of which we got a taste of in this Hula massacre, uh, and where ethnic cleansing could become very real. And, and so it's, it's hard. And uh, I think that, that, you know, this is my own personal view, that, that if the president is to be faulted at all, it's that we got diverted into, into Libya, which was a sideshow, when if we kept our eye on the big strategic prize, which was Syria, because of its role as the conduit of Iran's influence into the ha Middle East heartland, uh, maybe we could have affected things uh, before they deteriorated to the point where it's become very difficult. Now we're basically left with, uh, because of the re reluctance to intervene, we're left with a, a strategy that relies heavily on concerting the international community, on using diplomacy uh, to try to affect a an international consensus uh, in support of the demand that Assad step aside. And that's where our, uh, the energy of the Secretary of State is focused, to try to bring the Russians around to giving up on Assad, their client, a in a way that could begin the process of, of a transition uh, to a post-Assad uh, Syria. Um, and and at this point, that's probably the best we can do. I don't hold out high hopes for it. And we may, in the end, if things really deteriorate, which seems to me more likely than not, uh, we may end up in a Kosovo-type situation where, in the end, we will have to uh, intervene militarily, but we'll do so 
with the umbrella of international legitimacy because of having tried the other uh, way and, and it not having worked. Yes, my name is Steve Davis. I'm a member of the World Affairs Council. Do you think the president has made a serious case for the long-term international and domestic implications of the drone campaign? No, I don't think he has yet. Uh, I think that, generally speaking, he's been using drones fairly effectively and uh, maybe a little too much, but I think the pace of the last 12 months has been reasonable. Certainly on a week when we killed the number two al-Qaeda leader, apparently. Uh, it's hard to be too critical at one level. But, uh, and I support what he's done for the most part. But I also think that we're in an era of, of technology, as our colleague Peter Singer has written eloquently, where drones are spreading. It's not just going to be an American monopoly forever. And so leave aside executive branch versus congressional issues. Leave aside how many um, Americans who have made a bad decision about what group to go associate with abroad and put themselves in harm's way and it would be ideal to give them 10 years in prison rather than kill them. Leave aside those kind of debates that consume us right now. There are bigger issues out there. Just how do we make sure we don't start getting hit by drones someday? Geography is going to be our best friend for a while, but not necessarily our, the best friend of our allies. And so uh, in addition to the point that you've raised, I think there's a whole new question about rules of warfare for when you can use drones. And I think basically they are the equivalent of being at war uh, with any other means, including manned aircraft or other, uh, or boots on the ground, and they have to be treated as such, have to be viewed as such in the laws of war. So I consider that I would go along with those who say we're actually at war in several countries right now, to the extent you want to make a legal point about it. Uh, again, I'm not really disagreeing with the policy. I'm just trying to answer your question, which is a very haunting question, because even those of us who don't know how we would answer it, we have to recognize that it's going to have to be answered at some point. Ken, you had a thought on that. Uh, yeah, just to – this is not going to head my way. All right. You, you guys are going uh, to have to share. J just a brief additional comment, which is to say, to my mind, with both drones and with cyber warfare, uh, we are taking steps which are very understandable in their specifics, but are setting precedents that may well come back to haunt us, because these technologies are not staying at home. Uh, and so I worry about the failure to articulate a, uh, a sufficiently well-grounded doctrine that establishes boundaries, standards, and that kind of thing. Uh, we're going to have uh, a difficult time complaining among others begin to employ these same techniques in ways that we don't like. I just want to say, I don't know uh, if you uh, feel the same way I do, but I think this was a remarkable uh, panel. I think the, uh, the wisdom that was expressed here was just terrific. Um, and and uh, the, the last word is, by the book, uh, you, you will learn a lot. Well worth your while. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.